Hello, this is Dr. Ken with a lecture from my Chaucer's England class that I'm titling Mock Heroism. So um, we've already been introduced to the knight's tale and the kind of chivalric romances that are popular amongst the aristocracy in Chaucer's day and before. Um, and in many ways this connects up with that, talking about some of the, the source material from which these romances derive, as well as um, a kind of countercultural movement, if you like, uh, to the, the high flung, high class romance tradition uh, known as mock heroism, uh, which we find amongst the lower classes. So, uh, where where is this information coming from, first and foremost, that, that our nobles and our aristocrats in, in 14th century England like? Um, well, according to the medieval poet Jean Brodel, uh, he refers to the matter of Rome, and th this is a literary cycle made, made up of Greek and Roman mythology, together with episodes from the history of classical antiquity, uh, focusing on military heroes like Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. Uh, Brodel divided all the literary cycles he knew into the matter of Britain, the matter of France, the matter of Rome. Um, and so the matter of Rome also included what is referred to as the matter of Troy, uh, consisting of romances and other texts based on the Trojan War and its after effects, including the adventures of Aeneas in Virgil's Aeneid, which was widely read throughout the Middle Ages. So um, we have survivals from classical antiquity in mythology and literature, uh, Greek and Roman, that finds its way into um, into the Romance traditions. The matter of Britain, by the way, that, that has to do with like King Arthur, but not just King Arthur, uh, but the Arthurian legends, primarily the matter of France, uh, that will, as we'll see, concerns like the, um, the Song of Roland, the Chanson de Roland. Classical topics were the subjects of a good deal of old French literature, which in the case of Trojan subject matter, ultimately derived from Homer um, and Virgil, Pardon me, but it was built on scant sources, since the Iliad and Odyssey were unknown largely to most West, Western readers. Medieval Western poets had to make do with two short narratives in prose based on Homer, attributed to um, Dix's Cretensis and Dares Phrygias, um, late antique writers. The, 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 the paucity, the truthfulness of original or, or, or ver veracity of original text did not prevent the 12th or sorry, the scarcity rather of, of, of the original text didn't prevent the 12th century Norman poet Benoit de saint moi from writing a lengthy adaptation, Le Roman de Troy, the Romance of Troy, running some 40,000 lines. And so what normally happened uh, was the, the medieval poets would, would, would hear something about these ancient tales. They might have, depending on what it was, so Virgil's Aeneid they had intact, in Others they didn't, but they would then take them as, as a kind of starting point from which to produce their own um, their own versions of these things. As I've said before, plagiarism was largely unknown. It was expected that poets and, and other writers would take material from um, whatever sources they could find. So uh, the poems that were written on these topics were called the Romans d'Antiquité, uh, the Romances of Antiquity. The name uh, presages the anachronistic approach the medieval poets often used in dealing with these subjects. For example, the epic uh, poems Roman d'Alexandre and the Roman de Troyes, uh, Alexander the Great and Achilles and his fellow heroes of the Trojan War, are treated as knights of chivalry. Um, and as I've, as I've said before, concepts, receptions of Alexander the Great and also Achilles and other famous characters from mythology and, and Roman and Greek literature end up defining uh, for them chivalry, particularly Alexander the Great. Uh, and, and these are seen as, as, as not much different from other heroes in existence at the time. They seem to have envisioned the ancient past as, as you know, something that was more like life in their own eras. Elements of courtly love were introduced into the poems. In the Romance of Thebes, <clears throat> the Roman de Thebe, uh, a romantic relationship absent from the Greek sources is introduced into the late, um, uh, into the tale of, of Parthenopaeus and, and Antigone, 
Military episodes in these tales were also multiplied and used to introduce scenes of knight errantry and tournaments, which didn't happen in antiquity. Another example of French medieval poetry is the genre of the Aeneas, a treatment of Virgil's Aeneid, um, which comes across as being a sort of burlesque of, ancient, of the ancient poem. Um, sentimental and fantasy elements in the source material were multiplied, uh, and incidents from Ovid, the most popular Latin poet of the Middle Ages, were, were mixed into this pastiche. As, as we'll recall, Chaucer uses Ovid quite a lot, not just his metamorphosis, but, but some from his art of love. So the Philomela, attributed to Chrétien de Troyes, is a retelling of the story of Philomela and Procne, which also takes its source from Ovid's metamorphosis. And in that, um, a female character is, is, is effectively is raped, but turns uh, but her rapist gets turned into a bird. Um, this is the sort of thing, and, and she does as well, I believe. Uh, this is the sort of thing that uh, fires the imagination of the medieval writer. <clears throat> so Geoffrey Chaucer's Troilus and Cressida, for example, uh, is an English... Uh, type with Chaucer adding many elements to emphasize its connection with, with the, the subject matter. He also brought the story into line with the precepts of courtly love. And this is an anachronistic treatment from Greek mythology. It's similar to that of the Middle, middle English narrative poem Sir, o Sir Orfeo, where the Greek Orpheus uh, becomes the lyre-playing knight, Sir Orfeo, who rescues his wife, Herodis, which is Eurydice, from the fairy king. In the tale of Troilus and Cressida, what we have is um, a, a knight who's sent to fetch a princess who's going to marry his king. Somewhere along the way, they end up both drinking a love potion, um, and, and despite the fact that they're now you know, in love, magically in love with each other, as if struck by Venus's powers, um, being a noble knight and, and she a, a good lady, they don't, they don't consummate their love. So it's, it's, it's a good example of how courtly love sometimes involves an impossible object, uh, an impossible love object. Um, a topic that, or a, 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 a bit of subject matter from antiquity that, that truly fires the medieval imagination and, and, and results in multiple spin-offs, both East and West, is the Greek Alexander Romance. Um, <clears throat> this is a major example of, <coughs> <coughs> pardon me, of heroic virtue recast for the Middle Ages, um, and it comes from a body of legends uh, derived from, from about, well, from the time of Alexander the Great, but then much magnified, exaggerated, built upon in subsequent centuries. So it bases itself loosely on the actual history of Alexander the Great, but then contains many, many um, mythical, mythologized or fictionalized events that didn't happen in the history. So the, the chief source of all Alexander Romance literature was a folk epic written, by, uh, written in Greek by a Hellenized Egyptian uh, in Alexandria, probably during about the second century AD, again, basing it loosely on these earlier sources. Um, surviving translations and copies make its reconstruction roughly possible, and it portrayed Alexander um, as a national messianic hero, the natural son of an Egyptian wizard king by the wife of Philip II of Macedon. Magic and marvels played uh, a subsidiary part in the epic, in the story of Alexander's birth, for example, and his meeting with the Amazons in India. In later romances, however, marvels and exotic anecdotes predominated um, and gradually eclipsed any historical elements. This inspired the likes of Chrétien de, de Troyes and his Arthurian romances, and particularly the, the Grail Quest, it may surprise you to learn, came in no small part from this. Minor episodes in the original Alexander romance were filled out, often through letters supposedly written by or to Alexander, um, and, and an independent legend about his capture of the wild peoples of Gog and Magog was incorporated into several texts of many vernacular versions. An account of the Alexander legends was included in a 9th century Old English translation of Orosius's History of the World. In the 11th century, a, a Middle Irish Alexander romance appeared, and about 1100, a Middle High German version occurred. Um, 
as I say, the, these were incredibly popular stories and they spread far and wide. During the 12th century AD, Alexander appeared as a pattern of knightly chivalry and a succession of great, in a succession of great poems, beginning with the Roman d'Alexandre by Albrecht de Branchon. This work inspired the Alexander Lied by a German poet named Lamprecht de Faf. Um, an Anglo-Norman poet, Thomas of Kent, wrote the Roman de Toute Chevalier towards the end of the 12th century, um, based on the romance of Alexander. In about 1275, this was remodeled to become a Middle English romance of King Alexander, as it was called. Italian romances began to appear during the 14th century, closely followed by versions in Swedish, Danish, Scots, and uh, dating a little earlier in the Slavic languages as well. Um, there, there is an Icelandic saga based on the Alexander romance. And this is mainly just the Western tradition. There, there are others in the East as well. So Eastern accounts of Alexander's fabled career paid a good deal of, of attention to the Gog and Magog episode, a version of the story included in the Quran. Um, the Arabs expanding on Syrian versions of the legend uh, passed them on to the many peoples with whom they came into contact. Through them, the Persian poets, notably Nizami in the 12th century, gave the stories new form. And in the East, um, Alexander figures prominently in the Shanama, or Book of Kings of, of Iran or Persia. It's a long epic poem written by the Persian poet Ferdowsi between 977 and 10, uh, 1010 AD, um, and is the national epic of the Iranian cultural uh, region or, or nationality. It consists of about 60,000 verses, and the Shanama tells many, mainly, sorry, the mythical and to some extent historical past of, of greater Iran from the creation of the world up until the Islamic conquest of Persia in the 7th century. The work is of central importance to the Persian culture, regarded as a literary masterpiece um, and uh, definitive of ethno-national cultural identity of Iran. Uh, and the images that, that I'm showing you now are illustrations from Ferdowsi's Shanama and depict his encounter, Alexander's encounter, with the barbarous peoples of Gog and Magog, who are probably the Huns, and of course, chronologically, that doesn't work at all. Pardon me, but it's part of the, the literary tradition. Um, against whom he builds a wall of iron which will shatter on the day of judgment and release them into the world. Um, and that's from the Quran. There, there is, I should add, a, a historiographical debate in, amongst Eastern scholars as to whether or not the character of Dul Qunayn, uh, the two-horned one, is in fact Alexander the Great in the Quran. If it is, um, as, as I suspect it probably is, but again, there's a debate. If it is, then he, he, why he finds himself in both the Christian, uh, the Islamic, but also in the Jewish and, and, and possibly the Hindu tradition as well, which is, which is no small accomplishment for an historical figure. Um, Another image that you'll see uh, shows the, the, the Alexander speaking to the talking tree at the end of the world and is told his future. Um, what this means is that around the same time, roughly, in East and West, this literary tradition develops largely around Alexander the Great, not exclusively, but, but certainly around him. And, and it continues and it spreads outward. Um, now, about from the 12th century on, with a revival of classical learning, <clears throat> the Greek Romance tradition sort of falls out of, of, of popular, um, the, the popular view, although it's still present. But these sort of receptions of Alexander provide a common means of communication between East and West, and, and, and bizarrely sort of, you know, uh, 1,500, nearly 2,000 years after Alexander's own lifetime, <clears throat> he's, a, he's a kind of common bridge that allows individuals from these diverse cultures to communicate and that, that carries on actually into the 18th century AD. I'm getting slightly off track. Um, so Alexander provides one example. Um, <clears throat> now there are sort of two types of, of hero that we see uh, bridging the gap, as, again to use that metaphor, between you know, late antiquity and um, the medieval era. Uh, one is the the epic hero, and the other is the uh, chivalric hero. So I'll be talking about those now a bit and, and, and illustrating the differences in them. 
So um, heroes originate in the mists of time and myth, as we know. Uh, one scholar, Bloomfield, surmises that the original hero in early liter literature was probably based on the king who died for his people, the warrior who defended the tribe's enemies, defeated them, rather. Uh, and these men were celebrated in song and story and, and presented again in, in, to the people so that they could participate in their, in their magic, usually. Um, in Indo-European, the word hero has the primary sense of protector or helper, but in the Greek, eroe, it comes to mean um, a superhuman, a semi-divine being um, whose, whose special powers were put forth to save or help all of mankind, as a, or his, his, his particular ethnic group, usually you know, a favored part of it. The idea of the hero as the savior of the people dominates the early medieval epics, such as in Beowulf and the Song of Roland, which I'll come to in a moment. Um, a scholar named Fishwick has written that style uh, in heroes is, as in everything else, changes. And in the later medieval romances, such as Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the hero is no longer fighting for his people, but for his ideals. Um, so what we see is a shift from the early medieval to, to the late medieval period of a hero fighting for his, 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 his people. Um, to a hero fighting for usually some Christian ideal or chivalric ideal or something along those lines. Um, the study of the, of, the, of, the, of the nature and causes and cause rather this change then is critical to the understanding of what ultimately is the essence of a, of a medieval hero. So epic literature is a stately, solemn celebration of national life in the heroic age. Its heroes are simple men, usually, apart from Odysseus, maybe, versed in the activities of common life. They are leaders, not through class, status, or wealth, or even birth, but through the excellences of heart and mind and hands. Their motives are linked with the practical necessities of life. Well, this is this is Mormon. And he's talking, I think, about, again, um, maybe late antiquity here, not so much... Uh, the classical period where class did make a, a difference. An epic hero such as Beowulf or Roland possesses the qualities of valor, military prowess, loyalty, generosity, and honor. He's a man who fights because he must for the survival of his tribe or nation. Although the hero is constantly aware of his own mortality, he never shirks from the threat of, or, or peril, whatever it is. It is the hero's duty to preserve his life by valor. Um, it is the battle that is the, 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 it is in battle if the metal of the epic hero is tested. So, um, again, some, some more on the distinctions of these things. The epic hero may be said to exist in a kind of shame culture uh, or an honor-shame society where a man's mark, uh, or, sorry, a man's good name is his most prized possession. The society is hierarchical, that is controlled usually by a military aristocracy. Um whose highest good is the warrior's code. And that reflects, again, sort of the epic tradition of Homer. It is partly for this reason that Beowulf needs to kill the dragon and that Roland refuses to blow the horn. Genealogy in a hierarchical society is of great importance. And to fall into shame reflects not, what, not only uh, on oneself, but on the family and the nation. Um, so in the case of Beowulf, we've, we've got... Um, this sort of knightly figure who's going to fight a monster that, that's ravaging the community. Um, the song, you might be familiar with that, it's actually, it's written about, it's written by a Christian um, writing of an, of an earlier era with a kind of sort of nostalgic look at the pagan era of the old sort of Viking culture, so knight isn't quite the right term, although, although he's sort of portrayed a bit like one. Um, the Song of Roland is a different matter, and you might not be so familiar with that. Um, I'll go over some of the details of it briefly now. So the Song of Roland, La Chanson de Roland, it's an epic poem based on the Battle of Roncevaux Pass in 778 during the reign of the Emperor Charlemagne. Um, and it's the oldest surviving major work of French literature and exists in various manuscript versions which testify to its enormous and enduring popularity. Um, in the 12th and 14th centuries, so still widely read, you know, seven centuries after, nearly seven centuries after its time. It was probably um, 
completed, well, I should say seven centuries. Maybe there was a kind of oral tradition about it, but we think it was written down between 1040 and, and 1115 AD. Um, and uh, it's the first, the epic poem is, is the first, and along with the poem of Cid, El Cid, one of the most outstanding examples of the chanson de guest, a uh, literary form that flourished between the 11th and 15th centuries and celebrated legendary deeds. So what's going on here? Um, well, Charlemagne's army is fighting the Muslims in Spain. They've been there for seven years, um, and, um, and, and the last city standing is Saragossa, held by Muslim King Marseille. Uh, and he's th threatened by the might of Charlemagne's army of Franks. He seeks advice of his wise man who counsels him to conciliate the emperor, offering him to surrender and give hostages. Um, and Charlemagne, who's tired of fighting, accepts this peace accord. He offers uh, offer and selects a messenger to the court of the Muslim king. Roland, Roland uh, Charlemagne's nephew, nominates his stepfather as the messenger. Um, but he fears he's going to be murdered by the enemy and accuses Roland of, of, of intending this. He takes, re he takes revenge by informing the Saracens of a way to ambush the rear guard of Charlemagne's army, uh, which is led by Roland, as the Franks re-enter France through the mountain passes. Um, and and as, as, as Ganelon predicted, Roland leads the re re rear guard, which is the wise and moderate Oliver, with the wise and moderate Oliver and the fierce Archbishop Turpin. The Muslims ambush them at the Roncesvalles Pass, and the Christians are overwhelmed. Oliver pleads with Rowan to blow his horn and call for help, but Rowan tells him that blowing the horn in the middle of battle would be an act of cowardice. Uh, again, that rigid social hierarchy and, 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 and sense of, of duty. If he continues to refuse, if Rowan continues to refuse, Oliver says he won't let him see his sister again, whom Roland loves the most. However, Archbishop Turpin intervenes and tells him that the battle will be fatal uh, for all of them, so he instructs Roland to blow his horn. The horn is called oliphant, which, which is an old word meaning elephant, um, and it refers to a kind of hunting horn that was often made from an elephant's tusk. Roland blows his horn to call for help. The emperor hears the call all, all on their way to France, and Charlemagne and his noblemen gallop back, even though... Uh, Count Ganelon tries to trick them. The Franks with under Roland fight well, but they're outnumbered until almost all of Roland's men are, are dead. He knows that Charlemagne's army can no longer save them. Despite this, he blows the horn again to summon revenge until his temple, temples burst and he dies a martyr's death. Angels then take his soul up to paradise. Um, Charlemagne arrives and, and, and defeat the, the enemies there. Um, and, and there's a bit more to it. It concludes with a trial by combat and some divine intervention. But you get the gist of essentially how it's supposed to work. Um, and, and, and Roland, Roland is, a, is a really good illustration of this kind of epic hero that's popular in the early Middle Ages, but then sort of ceases to be in the late. So the field on which the epic hero performs is grounded in socio-political and historical reality. Um, Charles Mormon, a scholar on this, writes that the world in which Roland lives and fights is a very simple world. Uh, rapid rigidity and conformity uh, dominates. You know, th th these are described by the laws of the church and the emperor. So that rigid hierarchy, those who fight, those who work, those who pray, clearly, do, you know, is, is in full swing at that time. Although elements of the miraculous appear in the epic, they result in no more than a heightening or, or aggrandizement of reality. The epic heroes of Beowulf and Roland go down uh, to defeat and in some sense are responsible for their defeat. However, we know that even in defeat, partially of, of their own, however, we know the defeat's partially of their own doing. So if Roland had blowed his horn, blown his horn earlier, uh, things might have been different. They're heroes nonetheless, men above the common, above the average, who, whose drive for glory, whether heavenly or earthly, raises them beyond the ordinary and the average. They're big persons um, who are semi-divine, larger than human, who fascinate us by their valor, courage, and even bravura. The heroes of both Beowulf and Rowan perish and become exalted. Uh, what exalts Beowulf is his acceptance of, of his weird this old Anglo-Saxon word that means destiny. 
pardon me. Um, Gwen Jones defines the exaltation by, by writing, for if he accepts what is destined without bowing to it, he triumphs over it. An unbreakable will makes him the equal of all powerful fate, and though fate can destroy him, it can neither conquer nor humiliate him. Beowulf doesn't expect to return from his fight with the dragon in, in that epic. Nevertheless, he enters the battle. It is such courage and loyalty to his people that will cause songs to be composed and sung about him. Being commemorated in song contains the only immortality a warrior from Beowulf's pagan society could attain. Roland's heroic pride in refusing to blow his horn uh, assures his demise. However, his heroic nature is transformed into the saintly through his martyrdom, um, of the martyrdom of his death in battle, um, in a battle of ultimate Christian purpose. Roland is blessed and absolved by the Archbishop Turpin and valiantly held the field for God and country. An apotheosis like Roland's uh, hoop argues, for example, is reserved for heroes who reconcile the flawed hero and the flawless saint in the testimony of their martyrdoms and in exemplifying the providential concept of Felix culpa, happy guilt. So those are the epic heroes. Those are the epic heroes. Um, but by the time we get to Chaucer's era, the chivalric hero seems to be a more dominant type. So, um, the virtues of a chivalric hero are similar to those of the epic counterpart, but the difference of but valor, generosity, loyalty, honor, skill in battle. However, the sense given to loyalty um, at this period is more intricate and more significant. It is a quality of the soul. Um, the chivalric knight must also know temperance, courtesy, a reverence for women, um, and courtly skills. It is not enough that he perform on the field of battle. He must also be presentable at court, um, as, as Kristovich, a writer, uh, a scholar, writes of, of Gottfried's Tristan. Gottfried goes to great lengths to portray Tristan as a consummate artist. His education includes training in speech, good manners, and foreign languages, in addition to riding, hunting, wrestling, and fighting. Tristan is also a skilled musician, uh, a master of stringed instruments. <clears throat> As in heroic poetry, the chivalric knight is tested through trials of arms. Uh, however, whereas the epic hero fights only when circumstances require, the chivalric hero sets out to find a test or an adventure in which he can prove himself. And you see the difference between the two. Um, as another scholar, Eric Auerbach, says, trial through adventure is the real meaning of the knight's ideal existence. The chivalric hero rarely fights in, uh, in defense of his people, but in defense of an ideal or an abstraction. Um, another scholar, Finlayson, asserts that the chivalric hero himself is largely an idealization which bears little re re relation to, so to social reality and certainly didn't spring from it. The world in which the chivalric hero operates is also an imaginative idealization. I thought my teaching assistant here would like to uh, intervene and say a few words. Do you have anything to add there to the to the conversation? Yeah. Um, she's being a bit active in the background today, possibly because I'm ignoring her, but we'll let her sit up here and, and contribute something if she wants to. <laughs> As I was saying, um, the world in which the chivalric hero operates is also a kind of imaginative idealization. Although the world is described in the context of contemporary paraphernalia, such as clothing, architecture, and uh, feasts, there is little attempt to authenticate the story in terms of actual political, geographical, or economic conditions. There is a kind of imaginative or, or, or fairy land element to it. Whereas the epic is particular to a nation and a people, the romance is exotic, uh, the product of a particular sophisticated group rather than a whole culture. It reflects the, the, the class of society that tends to like it the most, that is the upper classes. Um, although the world of, of romance was an offspring of feudalism, in romance the feudal ethos character, uh, the ethos 
uh, serves no political function. It serves no practical reality at all. It has become absolute. It no longer has any purpose but that of self-realization. According to a scholar named Kelly, the main uh, explanation for this is that romance meets a need that is felt by those who want confirmation uh, of their world as they believe and want it to exist. So um, a way of reaffirming those ideals amongst the upper classes. The field in which the chivalric knight performs is a dream reality, a, a perilous landscape affording chance encounters with unnatural foes. The miraculous surprises of the chivalric knights very little, whether it be a castle appearing out of nowhere um, in response to a prayer, or a knight who survives beheading, as in the case of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. The circumstances that lead to the exaltation of the chivalric hero, such as Sir Gawain, for example, differ drastically from those of the epic hero. The epic hero gets tested in physical combat against a monster or another warrior. In Sir Gawain, there is a, uh, the hero's task is spiritual rather than physical. Gawain must pass all the requirements of the ideal chivalric knight in order to triumph, yet even though Gawain fails, he lacks in loyalty, as it turns out, says the Green Knight. Um, he does, in a sense, get exalted. His understanding and acceptance of his flawed nature and his confession leads to the Green Knight's absolution. Uh, whether this, his epiphany and self-imposed penitence qualify for exaltation has been hotly debated. Uh, Charles Mormon, for example, thinks not only that Gawain is a failure, but what had been the tragedy of a single knight becomes in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight the failure of a whole social order. The differences in the conception and execution of the epic and chivalric heroes can be best explained by the changes of an era. Heroic poetry was the poetry of a people in constant war footing, fighting for survival. Taylor attributes the difference in spirit between epic and romance to a deeply significant change in the national character, which moved from national unity to feudalism uh, and from national warfare to civil strife and fantastic crusades. Mormon attributes the knight errant to a time of peace when the knight can go questing. There arose for the first time in Western Europe a large leisure class um, that wanted to be entertained. The new feudalism, with its, um, with its leisure and highly stratified class structure, demanded a new hero, a man attuned to the niceties of conduct and indoctrinated in the values of courtly life. And so this is, this is coming about, you know, when the Crusades are, are more or less over, um, we know there are still a few in Chaucer's day, though they're mostly Crusades into Christendom, and they're, they're mostly sort of uh, smaller scale battles than, than what went on earlier in the Holy Land, um, until the Hundred Years War kicks off, you know, it, it, it's somewhat of a, of, a, of a more peaceful era, I suppose, relatively speaking. Um, and what's also happening, as we've seen, is this, the role of the knight in particular in traditional medieval combat going into decline, thanks to new technologies like the longbow and wider use of the crossbow, and, 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 and also even in the 14th century, the use of cannons. Um, so things are changing, and the role of the knight is less important. And I think, you know, we, we, we've seen and we'll see more of how chivalry seems to be on its way out. I think there was perhaps, you know, an unconscious awareness of this, and, and so the chivalric hero is a kind of last gasp of, of, of the feudal system in many respects. As Western Europe recovered its poise and security after the Dark Ages, it began to adopt new values and life patterns. The court replaced the castle. The courtly knight supplanted the brutal warrior, and the tangled thread of feudal relationships replaced the simple loyalties of warlords' councils. Despite all these differences, the epic and chivalric heroes were, had some common ground. The first of these is the Honorable Heroic Code. The heroes never fight a foe that is weaker uh, or in some way disadvantaged physically. The, the Grendels, for example, were a fair match for, for a man with the strength of 30 men in his grip. Um, 
as A.T. Halto points out about Beowulf. Beowulf also realizing Grendel had no, used no weapons, doffed his own to make it a fair fight. In the romance of Chaucer's Knight's Tale, we'll recall, recall this, Arcite equips Palamon before their duel. Um, it was merely the courtesy one knight owed to the other, says uh, Painter. The second similarity between the heroes is the rite de passage, the rite of passage, uh, or what Mormon calls the journey initiation quest. Beowulf travels to Hrothgar's court to battle Grendel and subsequently Grendel's mother. Upon Beowulf's return, Hygelech feels him worthy um, and of leading his people upon his passing away. Roland, for example, travels with the rear guard toward France and through martyrdom achieves sainthood. Gawain travels through the land for a year in search, a year and a day, in search of the Green Knight and finds uh, Bertilek's castle uh, through prayer when he was at his weariest. Mormon emphasizes that the, pas the passage of the soul through its difficulties to its triumph at Astra Parastra, through difficulties to the stars, is constantly observable. Uh, thirdly, the most striking similarity uh, between the epic and chivalric hero is the presence of weird fate or providence. The failure of the heroes to some uh, degree and, and the way that the epic and chivalric hero accept both their failure and their lots. Also, they all stand up to insurmountable odds. Beowulf and the dragon, Roland and the Saracens, Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, this heroic courage finds astute expression by Gawain um, in, in, in Destiny's Sad or Merry, True Men Can But Try, he says. So... Um, it's quite an interesting study between the chivalric and the, the the epic heroes and the change that's taking place, which reflects changes in society. The um, the upper classes obviously love these things. They like hearing about them. They try to model their lives to some extent after them. Um, but things are changing. And one symptom of that, I think, although, it, again, is a long time coming, but certainly picks up, picking up a pace in Chaucer's era is the increase in mock heroism. Um, so, as I'm saying, there is a kind of a counter movement, if you like, against the chivalric hero, and that comes in the form of mock heroism. Um, it, it's part of the subversive marginal literature of the Middle Ages that perhaps offers some kind of critical commentary on society. It often reverses the expected norms and exposes the gap between the ideal and the real. So, you know, the sort of things we've been talking about with um, chivalric knights and, and their adventures, they're unrealistic. Um, and I, I think the mock heroic literature especially uh, is a way of, of pointing this out. One of these, one that was incredibly popular all over Europe and in Britain as well, was the romance of Reynard the Fox, the crafty courtier, um, and the shifts of his son, Reynardine. So Reynard the Fox was a medieval trickster character, uh, a nasty but charismatic individual who was always in trouble but always able to talk his way out of any situation. Um, he was He's a celebrated hero of the medieval beast epics, works predominantly in verse, which became increasingly popular after about 1150, AD. They're found chiefly in Latin, but also French, Low German, Dutch, High German, and in English. The type probably originated in a German-speaking section of what is now the Alsace-Lorraine Alsace region, whence it passed into France, the Low Countries, and Germany. Um, and the tale can be more or less summarized as follows. Uh, the summons of King Noble, the Lion, uh, to answer accusations by Isengrim, the wolf, and other animals form the nucleus and starting point of these, these, these loosely connected tales. Most of the stories reflect the inviting satire, the peasants' criticism and contempt of the upper classes um, and the clergy. An episode uh, at once outstanding and lyrical is the funeral of Reynard. Um, and the, with the pious lament, laments of his, of his late enemies and his devastating resurrection from the grave because he wasn't really dead, he fakes his own death. Professional minstrels and, and, and um, poets soon found these tales good entertainment and made them popular 
with the upper and middle classes. The French, who contributed most to the original story, produced Le Roman de Renault, the Romance of Reynard, about 12, between 1175 and 1250. Caxton translated it from a Flemish version um, into his History of, of Reynard the Fox in English in 1481. Modern English versions include T.J. Arnold's translation from 1880 and Goethe's Rinicke Fuchs, um, a, a paraphrase of the older High German version uh, and William Rose's Epic of the Beasts from 1924. I'll, um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but I, I will give you, I'll read you a little bit from the introduction to the history of Reynard the Fox. Uh, so uh, actually, I'll summarize it because it's in it's in Middle English. Um, but essentially, what happens is the lion king noble uh, summons the other animals, uh, and and they accuse Reynard of, of various things. Um, since the story was written by, and, and then he then he has to use his cleverness to get out of them, usually through, through faking his own death or something along those lines. Since the story was written by many different authors, there's no complete storyline to the Beast epics, but only episodes. The only thing binding the different stories is, is the character of Reynard um, and eight syllable rhyming couplets in which the stories were typically told. However, there were some attempts to put the Reynard stories together and these were made at the beginning um, and uh, uh, sort of gave it a kind of beginning and ending. The beginning of the story is usually, as I say, a meeting of the animal court. Various animals accuse Reynard of crimes, though the most vocal is Isengrim the wolf um, and Chanticleer the rooster. Uh, and we'll recall Chanticleer, or you, maybe not yet, but Chanticleer is a character in, in one of Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. Um, these two charge Reynard with adultery and murder. Um, and it's decided that Reynard is to be hanged. Various animals are sent to collect Reynard, but only uh, only Grumbert, Grimbert, rather the badger, who's Reynard's nephew, somehow is able to convince Reynard to defend himself at court while avoiding one of uh, one of his tricks. Reynard appears; it, it, it has the quality of a Bugs Bunny cartoon, and, and probably um, influenced those to some extent as well. Eventually, Reynard. Um, Sorry, so he, he appears at the court, is able to trick King Noble the lion into letting him go. Eventually, uh, he murders a rabbit, forcing Grimbert to summon his uncle to court yet again. Reynard once again tricks the king, but this time Isengrim challenges him to a duel. Reynard is able to win the duel through trickery um, and given a high status in the court as a result. Eventually, Isengrim challenges him again. This time to a game of chess, Reynard, overconfident and drunk, loses the game as well as the bet giving Isengrim claim over any part of his body that Isengrim chooses. Isengrim wounds Reynard uh, after this loss. And Reynard is thought dead. His funeral is then held um, and his old enemies come and eulogize their enemy. He, he revives though, um, only to be attacked by the rooster Chanticleer who seems to kill him in, in a nearby river. In fact, Reynard only pretends to be dead, returning to his wife and children in the village of Malperdi, uh, while everyone thinks him dead, inspiring the most quoted line in the epic, usually translated as, yet Reynard still lives on. Um, and his wife, for some reason, is a goat, um, as you'll see in the picture. The nun's priest tale from Chaucer's Canterbury Tales is a variant of the Reynard story. There are many of these, as I say. Um, but those particularly that have to do with the court of the king and Reynard tricking the king, uh, th this is a case of, of sort of low satire of, of the kind of chivalric tales. Another type of medieval um, satire I I or romance describing the adventures, des describes the adventures of, and conversations of King Solomon with one Markov the Fool. Um, these have some connection with those of, of the Ash, Ashmedai, ancient Kabbalistic Jewish tales about the demon Asmodeus, while the conversations consist chiefly of the riddles uh, similar to those put to Solomon by the Queen of Sheba in the Bible. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them all for want of time, but um, you can read these for yourselves in the notes or, or those of you who 
who aren't in my class, who for, for whatever reasons are watching this, you can you can probably Google and find these easily enough. Um, but they're a really good example of someone quite low down on the hierarchy making someone high up on the hierarchy look like a fool. So um, Solomon, full of wisdom and riches, sits, sits upon his throne, the throne of his father, King David, um, and he sees coming from the direction of the east a certain person, we're told, most exceedingly ugly and misshapen, but most eloquent, named Markov. With this person was his wife, who was also extremely frightful and boorish. When the, queen, the king had ordered them to be brought together into his sight, the two of them stood before him, looking at each other in turn. Well then, uh, in, in build, Markov was short and squat. Uh, he had a great big head, very broad red and wrinkled forehead, ears that were hairy and hung down all the way to the middle of his jaws, fat and bleary eyes, a lower lip like the horse's, uh, a, dirty, a, a dirty beard that reeked like a goat's, uh, stubby hands, short and, 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 and squat fingers, round feet, uh, a thick and bulging nose, large and fat lips, a face like a donkey's hair, uh, like the spines of a hedgehog, um, a hair like the spines of a, of, of a hedgehog, a face like a donkey's. These are the descriptions. So you, you have this, this character in contrast, in sharp contrast to King Solomon. Um, he comes riding a goat with one shoe on and one shoe off. Um, and the description of his wife is equally sort of disturbing and decrepit. These two characters, Markov and Solomon, get into a dialogue, a discussion, um, and, and basically asking each other questions and offering answers. And um, so, so Solomon goes through his pedigree, describing all of his ancestors in a series of begots, which anyone familiar with the Old Testament will identify immediately. Markov then comes up with his own list of begots, and, and, and they're all sort of uh, low-born scoundrels like himself. So again, you have this, this contrast between Solomon, the noble King Solomon, and this anything-but-noble character. Um, and, and they engage in this con contest of riddles, if you like. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through all that right now, but I'll give you some examples of it. Um, they're talking about wives. Solomon says, A wise wife builds her home, but an unwise one will destroy with her hands a home that has been built. Markov says, A well-fired pot lasts better, and he who stirs in shit drinks shit. Um, Solomon says, a God-fearing wife will herself be praised. Markov says, a cat with a good fur will itself be skinned. Solomon says, a modest woman is much to be loved. Markov says, a poor man should keep possession of a milk cow. Uh, Solomon says, who will find a strong woman? Markov, who will locate a cat with, that is trustworthy about milk? No one, says Solomon. Markov says, and rarely can one locate such a woman. Solomon says, a well-formed and honest woman is to be held above all desirable goods. Markov says, a fat and large woman is more lavish in producing farts. And Solomon says, take your feet away from a brawling woman. And Markov says, take your nose away from a farting asshole. Um, and, and this is sort of the tenor of it. It, it goes on and on. You can see where um, certain types of humor may be derived from this. Ultimately, um, Markov insults Solomon enough that he's going to have him put to death, but he grants Markov the, um, the courtesy of, of deciding on which tree he is to be hung. Um, and sees this man hanging from a tree, Solomon says, after, after the insults are enough. Uh, but Markov can be, uh, had been seized, he said to the king, My lord king, you can bestow upon me uh, so much mercy that I be hanged on the tree that I choose. Solomon says, let it be so. Uh, it is of no account to me on which tree you're, you're hanged. Then the king's attendants, laying hold of Markov, led him outside the city, and passing through the valley of Jehoshaphat and the slopes of the Mount of Olives, they carried out. Uh, car they arrived at last at Jericho, and they could find no tree that Markov would choose for his hanging. From there, crossing the Jordan and traversing the whole of Arabia, Markov chose none of those trees. Uh, from there, going around the forest of Carmel and the cedars of Lebanon and the wildernesses of Campester, around the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Ashtaroth 
and Oreb and Kadesh and, and Barna and the land of Moab, Mar Markov chose none of those trees. Uh, from there, tra traversing Hebron and Bethel and Jarmuth and Lachish and Eglon and Gazar and Debir and Gadara and Home and uh, Libna and Adalam and Makeda, uh, Markov chose none of those trees for his hanging. Uh, and since they could not find a tree that Markov would choose, they let him go. And thus Markov eluded the hands of King Solomon. So uh, that, those, these are the stories of Markov and Sol Solomon. So this and, you know, Reynard the Fox stand in, in rather sharp contrast, but these stories were much more popular, much more widely un, you know, known by ordinary folk in the Middle Ages um, and, and seem to be, you know, pointing a satirical finger at uh, the sort of high-flung stuff that the nobility liked. So we'll think about this with Chaucer. Um, and I'll define for you now satire. I've been using the term a lot, but let's, let's define it. So satire is a literary work where human vice or folly is pointed out through humor, irony, and wit. It exposes the gap between the ideal and the real. A satire differs from a comedy because comedy just invokes laughter as its main objective, and satire uses laughter as a weapon to point out fault with a topic outside of the work. Satire is created using exaggeration, metaphor, innocence, comparison, and irony. Chaucer will employ a specific tool called the mock heroic style to illustrate irony and human vice. Mock heroic style makes a very small incident or common occurrence into something very dramatic. So, for example, with total devotion and concentration and hardly breathing at all, Tom carefully applied the comb to the curl that had violated the upper part of his ear. So talking about a very mundane task with, with high-flung heroic style language. So a mock hero is not a real hero, but treated like something special to point out something humorous to the reader. When considering the impact of satire on Chaucer, uh, on Chaucer's listening audience, it's important to consider that they were listening to the story as a means of entertainment. They, went, they want to laugh, not necessarily solve the problems of the world. It is a light satirical comedy that we see in Chaucer's uh, true comments on his medieval world. So ask yourself as you're reading this, what vice or folly is Chaucer drawing attention to in the story? And we'll think about that with Chaucer and the wider, wider Middle Ages, especially when we come a bit later on to um, the marginalia, which are also a form of, of, of sort of challenging the social order. But that'll be challenging the social order will be next week's topic. We'll leave that for now. Thank you very much for your attention.